Welcome everyone to Taurus for Everyone. Welcome Miriam and Baruch and Jerry and to all those who are watching. Uh, the, the Torah portion this week is called Who Remembers What It Is. Sorry to put you on this one. T-Z-A-V, right, Tzav. You know the word mitzvah? Right. Make and a mitzvah, do a good deed. Well, it, but it's not really a good deed. A tzav, a mitzvah, is a commandment. Mm. The Ten Commandments are the mitzvot. Right. It's, it's the root. Hebrew has a root of three letters. So in this letter, it's tzav, would, which would be, uh, I guess, a tzadi. And a vav, the, and I'm not sure what the middle letter is because usually the the roots are, are three three letters in Hebrew, and then from that you get many other words. So tzav means command. Now, if we didn't have free will, bechira chofshit, God wouldn't have to command us to do something because we would we wouldn't be able to have a choice. We would just do it. We would do what he says. But we have a choice. <clears throat> he gives us commands for our good so that we could choose to do them. And when, he, and when we do them, we are, we, it, it gives us life. We are fulfilled. When we don't do them, so remember, now in those days, in the days that we're talking about, many of the nations brought sacrifices to appease their gods. We don't have to appease God. We can't buy him. He doesn't accept any of our, our offerings if we don't bring them willingly with all our hearts when we acknowledge them. And this In this portion, we're going to see there's one verse that talks about all of the five types of offerings that there are, and then we'll explain what they are. So, uh, and and it sa it'll say... Uh, Zot Torah, which means these are the Torah, the instructions for the different offerings. So let me share the screen. And let's go to Leviticus. Are you using Sepharic or, uh, or Yerush? Sepharia, yes, I'm using Sepharia. Okay. Okay, so here we go. I may skip over some verses because for me, what I want to do is, is remember, these are not to be taken Literally, we're looking at God is speaking to the people at that time. They were in the desert. They had just been freed from Egypt. We had just built a Mishkan. And now God is building a focal point in the Mishkan. He's, he's going to inaugurate the priests, the Kohenim, and he's going to tell them what kind of offerings he wants us to bring. They are different than the sacrifices that were made to the gods. These were offerings. So God, God spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his sons. It says here, Tzav et Aharon et B'nei Lemor, saying to him, Zot Torat Ola Haolam. These are the instructions forever. Of, and this is for the Ola. I don't know if you remember what I talked about, what Ola means. They translate it as burnt offering. But actually, it, it's more of the idea of to rise up, elevation. Remember, when you make aliyah, you, we are called olim. We, aliyah, we go up to Israel. So this is an elevation offering. It's to elevate ourselves spiritually. And this type of offering will remain where it is burnt on the altar all night and all morning while the fire is kept going on it. The priest, the Kohen, shall dress in linen, with linen breeches next to his body. This was very practical. It's very hot in the Middle East. And linen is one of the coolest materials. So he had to dress in linen. And so he wouldn't schwitz. And he's to take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced on the burnt offering. And then he had to take off his the linen garments, and put on other garments to carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place because he wasn't going to wear the white, beautiful linen to take out the garbage. That's basically it. We don't put on our best clothes to take out the garbage. 
These are all very practical things that we read. The fire will be kept burning, not to go out. It's like the fire within us. We are to keep it burning, not to, not to allow it to go out as we approach our God. Now, not everyone wants to approach God. People are afraid to approach God. It's an awesome thing to stand in the presence of light because all the schmutz starts to show. I remember when I first had my cataracts done on my eyes. I could hardly see in those days. I had the cataracts done and I came home and I looked around my house and I saw all the dust that I couldn't see before. Well, it's like standing in the presence of God. He shows you everything. And a lot of people don't want to see what's going on inside. We prefer to just remain as we are. Don't give me too much responsibility. I don't want to take it on. Because remember, the more one is given, the more is required from us. That's why Moses always fought against being a leader. You don't want to be a leader. Too much responsibility. There's very few people who are willing to take responsibility. So every morning the priest would put feed wood on it. He had to keep it going. This was work. They had to constantly work to keep this fire going. It wasn't a glamorous job. It was hard work. They had to lay out the, the offerings, the elevation offerings, and turn this, the fat parts. We weren't to eat that. We were to turn, he was to turn it into smoke for the offering of, this was one of the offerings, shalamim, well-being. Shalom, shalamim is like a, the, the wholeness. Shalom, shalema, I wish you a, a rafua shalema, a full healing. When you say Shabbat Shalom, you, uh, we wish you a day of, of well-being, of peace, of fullness. These words in Hebrew are marvelous. A perpetual fire. It must say Eish Haolam, something like that. Eish Tamid, forever. Tamid is forever. The, like the Ner Tamid. Like the Ner Tamid, exactly. The, the fire shall be kept burning on the altar not to go out. And this is the ritual. This is, again, Vezot Torah. This is the Torah, the instructions. Ha-mincha, the mincha, are the meal offerings, the grain, the fine flour, okay? And Aaron's son shall present it before the Lord in front of the altar. It was also, the meal offering was also burnt up completely. This was not to be eaten. This first offering would have been an offering of, of just acknowledging who God is and, and keep him in reverence. None of, none, it wasn't for food. They were to take a handful of choice flour, the best of the flour, add oil. Um, make uh, This meal offering shall be taken from it with all the incense that's on the meal offering. And this token portion shall be turned into smoke on the altar as a here it says, pleasing odor again, pleasing aroma to the Lord. Here it says, which means, reach is the same word as ruach, which is a scent or, a, or the wind, the spirit. It, it, it comes from the idea of, of, of um, just that, and nechoyach is like, um, uh, oh, I wrote it down here. Hold on a second. I have it. What did I do with it? I made such good notes. Um, da -da -da -da. Well, I'll find it when I go down. But it's like what the rabbi said. It was like, like nechon. It's, it's pleasing. It's acceptable. It's a pleasing uh, odor to God. What is left of it shall be eaten by Aaron and his sons. It shall be eaten as unleavened cakes in the sacred precinct, and they shall eat it in the enclosure of the tent of meaning. I guess this one was not an ola. It's a mincha, so it's not completely burnt up. And they could even eat the frankincense that, that was in it. The frankincense, actually, if you look it up on Google, you'll see there's a lot of healthy properties to the frankincense. It shall not be baked with leaven, which means that this was Pesach. 
I have given it as their portion from my offerings by fire. It is most holy, like the, and there's two other offerings here, like the, this was called sin, but the word is chata'at. And the chata'at is, is more of an acknowledgement that we have done something wrong, but unintentionally. It's like we just missed the mark and we need to make it right. Sometimes we know when we do something wrong and, oh, oops, I did it again. And so that we would bring a, a chata'at offering. Only the males among Aaron's descendants may eat of it, as they're due for all time throughout the ages from the Lord's offering by fire. Anything that touches these shall be holy. The males in Judaism were given a role of being the spiritual overseers for the community. And one of the reasons that this happened is because of when Adam did not protect his wife Eve, when she took from the fruit and she ate it and she convinced him to eat it, he was to be her protector. He was to be the one who would have dominion over all creation. And Adam didn't do it. So now the male, so they fell under, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, Eden, and basically mankind fell under a curse. We are still under that curse where the males are now being forced to take their role of spiritual heads. It's not that women cannot do what men do, but it's not our calling. It's not our role. It's the male to take the spiritual head, not only in the homes, in the synagogues. In this community, we don't believe in the woman having the spiritual headship. There are no female rabbis, no female priestesses. That was a pagan thing to have a female priest. So it has nothing to do with value. It has to do with the role. The women also, because Eve had disobeyed, she was, she also fell under a curse, one where she would have to be under the male. Remember that if it's a curse, you're under. So it, literally she fell from God's grace of being superior, the highest of God's creation, to be under the spiritual governance of men. And she would have pain in childbirth and man would have to work by the sweat of his brow. And we can see here how much sweat these Kohanim went through. It was hard work. And we're going to see, because they had to keep putting on the wood, keeping the altar going. They couldn't let it go out. It was a lot of work. And, and the, sacri the, the offerings, every holiday, every Shabbat, it was a lot of work. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is the offering that Aaron and his sons shall offer to the Lord on his when he was he's going to be ordained and and so when he was ordained they would take a tenth of an ephah a flower as a regular meal offering half of it in the morning half of it in the evening they shall prepare it with oil on a griddle it's like they're making bread or pancakes or pita you shall bring it well soaked and offer it as a meal offering of baked slices pleasing odor to the Lord. So here you see an offering that has nothing to do with the shedding of blood. And so shall the Kohen, anointed from among his sons to succeed him, they shall prepare it. It is yud heh vav it is his chok olam, a, a regulation that we don't always understand forever to be turned entirely into smoke. So too, every meal offering of a Kohen shall be a complete offering. It shall not be eaten. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons in this way. Here you're going to see, uh, this is the ritual offering. Is it this one? This is the Torah Chata'at. Torah Chata'at. This is the ritual of the offering where you knew that you did something wrong. You're missing the mark. Bemekom in the place where 
um, the uh, tishachet, like the shochet, is the one who is the butcher, like the who does the offering. This shall be slaughtered before the Lord at the spot, the place where the Ola was slaughtered. It is most holy. The Kohen who offers it as a sin offering, as a chata'at again, shall eat of it. It shall be eaten. So you see, these animals were not just to be sacrificed. They were to be brought for, to feed the people, to feed the people who brought them, brought them, the others who had come there to, as witnesses, and the Kohen themselves, the Kohanim, inside the tent of meeting. Anything that touches its flesh shall be holy. If any of the blood is splattered, spattered on a garment, you shall wash the part of the garment in a sacred place. So this is a hook. Remember, we don't always understand why it's being done, but we know we just need to do it. An earthen vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. If it was boiled in a copper vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed with water. Only the males of the priestly line may eat of it. It is most holy. They were the ones who had to be bring themselves first before God. And, and they had to be the ones who would be the cleanest, had, rid, had to rid their own sins before they could represent the people. No sin offering may be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting for covering in the sanctuary. Any such shall be consumed in fire. So we don't, we are not allowed to eat blood and it's going to talk about that again soon. Okay, this is, now we're dealing with, with another one. This, Vizot Torat Ha Asham. This is what's called the guilt offering. It's an offering that, when we are guilty of something that we did and we that we did unintentionally but it makes us feel terrible we can all we all feel guilty about something that we've done what do we do about it god guilt doesn't help us we need well, where to... is sorry peggy yeah where where is it say unintentional again it, there is no to... sin there's no offering for intentional sin all these are unintentional okay yeah. Um, I don't know exactly where it says it, but I know it says it. We, we'd have to, well, I'd have to find it. But I remember our rabbi teaching us that there was no offering for intentional sin. The only uh, forgiveness for intentional sin is when the person acknowledges what they've done and they bring it to, they bring, they, they, they can't, they have to make teshuva. You have to go to the Lord. But He'll forgive our sin, but we still have to pay the consequences of it. Let's say if somebody murdered someone intentionally, they're going to have to be put to death. That's so there's that's, no um, there's no person who could die for our sins, quite frankly. <laughs> absolutely like this, not. This is saying because uh, if, if it's an un, unintentional sin uh, and the sins that uh, Jesus supposedly died for, were were sins of uh, intentional sins? Exactly, unintentional. No, no, but but the the, the oh, the they Christian, say Christian doctrine. I mean, if you rob a bank or whatever, that's intentional sin, right? So, so you know, uh, uh, no man died for our sins. No, that was all made up long after his death. That was that came. Those were the. The laws that came out of the uh, the Catholic Church when the Roman Empire became the Roman Church, and the Council of Nicaea made all these saints and and they formed they created a Jesus Christ, a God who was half man, half God, and and there's no way that you will find the things that they say Jesus did in the Torah. They had to the Catholicism had to get rid of the Torah in order to promulgate to promulgate or propagate whatever you want to call it to to sell their doctrines their dogmas their you know we we see that they would they would buy um they would buy their freedom they would buy their their um 
uh, forgiveness and you cannot buy God's forgiveness. You have to, you here in at this time, they would have to take an offering, but not, not for um, intentional sin. For unintentional sin, we'll read later on, they would build these, remember the cities of refuge, where if someone unintentionally killed somebody by accident, they would run to those, to one of those cities where they would be safe so that the family wouldn't come and take vengeance upon them. Okay? So the guilt offering shall be slaughtered on the spot where the burnt offering was slaughtered, and the blood shall be dashed on the sides of the altar. All its fat should be offered. They burnt all the fat because we're not supposed to eat that kind of suet, that heavy fat that's on the animal. It's very bad for our health the broad tail and the fat that covers the entrails, kidneys, and here's just talking about the different animals, what, what they had to do. Again, only the priestly line. So the guilt offering is like the sin offering. The same rule applies to both. It shall belong to the Kohen to make, to cover the people. Okay? So the Kohen would offer another person's burnt offerings. Okay, here again, the meal offerings. I'm not going to keep repeating it because it's just the same thing. And then we have another type of offering. This was the shalamim that I mentioned before. The, the shalamim has to do with the um, a thanksgiving offering, an offering of peace, of well-being, of shalom. And um, this is the what the rabbis say is if the temp, when the temple gets rebuilt, the only offering that's going to be done then is the shalamim and um, why they would want to again reinstate the sacrificial system is is really beyond me because do, do you know why um, they only want they're only thinking about that offering to get to continue no I don't okay I didn't I didn't know that until this moment yeah I thought they wanted to do all the offerings again. No, this is the one. And I just, to tell you the truth, I was listening to Rabbi's message and he said it in there. And unfortunately, because I have been so busy, I didn't have time to do any more research on it, but I'm sure we could find it. It's, it's easy to find, you know, I'm bringing you things here, not because I know everything because I know a little, but it's for all of us to see that anybody can read the Torah. We don't have to have all the answers. We can get them if we want them. They are there. It, the Torah explains itself. And if it's not here, it'll be a little later. And maybe the prophets or the Psalms. But God wants us to know why we're doing things. Although some of the things we do only because he said so. The first three commandments, remember the mitzvot. The, the first three commandments are our relationship with God. The middle two our chukim. We don't know why. Why did God ask us to keep the Shabbat one day a week? We have ideas. Why did he tell us to honor our parents? We have ideas, but those are called chukim. We do them because he said so. We need to honor. If we can't honor our parents, we'll never be able to honor God. If we can't take one day off, then we don't trust him at all. It's really all about trust. And the last five are, are mishpatim. Those are the the ordinances of how to treat our neighbor. Okay, so the offering with cakes of unleavened bread shall be offered with the shalamim. Okay, let me continue. And the flesh of the thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being shall be eaten. None of it shall be set aside until morning. Okay, let me continue on here. And Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people thus, you shall eat no fat. The fat is like the hard, coarse fat, the suet of the ox, the sheep, or the goat. It's not healthy. So eat no fat. Fat from animals that died or were torn by beast may be put to use. You know, they would burn it up. They would make soap. And maybe they can make candles but you must not eat it. Anyone, Miriam, you're great at that. You like your smoked meat lean. I like it with a little bit of fat, but I'm not <laughs> sure this is the type of fat that he's talking about. There's a much 
those big pieces of fat that cannot be I think that's even cut up when they even complete your thing about smoke meat I think the big big fat part is cut off anyway exactly if anyone eats the fat of animals from which all offerings by fire may be made to the Lord, the person who eats it shall be cut off from kin. That's very interesting. That's how serious God is about us not eating that because he wants us to be healthy. He wants us to have well-being. He's teaching us what to do. You must not consume any blood, either a bird or an animal in any of your settlements. And you ask anybody, kosher or unkosher, they don't want to eat blood. It's it's a ugh, that's something that we've all grown up with. We weren't religious, but we knew not to eat the blood of any animal. You know, when you when you see these foods like blood pudding or, you know, because the pagans the pagans would take the heart out of an animal and, you know, eat it, put the blood all the it's like th that was there where they got their strength, their courage. This is all Mishigas. Satanic God. rituals also. That's why I think this is directly to to take away any behavior that was uh, um, pagan, pagan and reflected um, and, uh, and a desire to appease the gods, whatever. I mean, even now, satanic rituals will involve drinking blood. Exactly, it's true. We're not consume any blood. Anyone who eats blood shall be cut off from kin, from their families. And God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelite people in this way. The offering to the Lord of a sacrifice of well-being must be presented by the one who offers that sacrifice of well-being. One's own hands shall present the Lord's offering by fire. In other words, you can't send a representative. You need to go yourself. If you have an issue that you want to deal with, a, a thanksgiving, you go yourself. The offerer shall present the fat of the breast and the breast to be elevated as an elevated offering. Okay, it continues on. Um, da, da, da. What's it called if you run into the street to save somebody? What do you mean? Bravery. Uh, I ran in the street to save a kid from getting hit. You did? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. Well, I, I don't know what you'd call that. I guess just Thanksgiving. That the, so here, this is the, the verse I was telling you about. Zot HaTorah Le'olam. These are the offerings forever. Le Mincha, the Mincha are the meal offerings. The Ola, the burnt offerings. Le, le Chata'at, the sin offering. Le Asham, the guilt offering. This is the offering of ordination, miluim, and the sacrifice offering of well-being, uh, ha shalamim. So again, the ola is the, which is called the burnt offering, is actually the acknowledgement of how great our God is. It's it's everything is burnt up. It's meant to show our reverence to Him. No food is eaten, whether an animal, a bird, or a gra or grain. It's fully burnt off, burnt up. Even the grain offerings were completely burnt. The chatat is not really a sin offering. It's the acknowledgement that we did something wrong unintentionally. We missed the mark. We need to make it right. The asham is the offering that we are guilty of something. You know, I know people who have lived with guilt all their lives. And because they've never been willing to deal with anything, they end up with such high level anxiety that they they are they, they end up with honestly almost mental illness we need to deal with our guilt there's no reason to hold on to guilt Ex and, and, and what shall i say there, there's a difference between guilt and conviction when we are when we have the conviction that we have done something wrong we have an opportunity to make it right. We ask for forgiveness, not only from God, but from the people we hurt, and then we make it right. The asham is the offering that 
another, it's also guilty of something that we did unintentionally. It makes us feel bad. Oh no, that's the one I just did. Then the shalamim. The shalamim is a thanksgiving offering. Sometimes you just want to give God thanks. And I know that's happened so often when, when I've watched God do something amazing in my life and I go, wow, thank you so much. So these are all offerings. We don't need an animal to do them today. It was all at that time, no longer necessary today. We don't have a temple. We don't have the Mishkan. We're not going to bring offerings to the synagogues. We have access to go directly to God. Each and every one of us has that accent. All we want, all we need to do is be willing to draw near to the light, to approach him, Kerev, by bringing the Korban is the same root. We are the Korban. We are the ones who have to go before God and acknowledge what we've done. It, it, it's absolutely beautiful. And then chapter eight, is all about the ordination service of the Kohanim. Now, the service to God is called Avodah, Avodat Adonai, the work that they were being prepared to do. Each of us has work that we are prepared to do. It's not the same as Christianity where they say, oh, we need to go to worship God. The original word for worship was workmanship. They had to work very hard in the temple and in the Mishkan, constantly keeping the fire going. As I said, constantly uh, accepting these offerings, bringing the animals before God, forgiving the people. There was a, it was constant, a lot of work, but it was like going to the psychiatrist of the day. When we, and, and what God wants us to do is to do something for other people. This is all about the work that the Kohanim needed to do was to represent the people. Today, we, um, when we bring offerings to him, it's by doing something for somebody else. Doing something for other people. When there's a need, we need to help. We understand his greatness and we each respond to him. Serving the creator is serving the community, not ourselves. So God doesn't want us to be religious and performing externally for others. But a true believer is somebody who knows him and knows that the creator knows us. There is no place that we can hide from him. So I just wanted to, to read a little bit from a couple of other other um, uh, verses, and these are come from the our prophets, because some religions teach that the shedding of in the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. That without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. Um, so, but I want to show you what it says here in um, text Tanakh. Let me go first to Hosea. Now, Hosea is a very interesting prophet. Can you see this? Or I have, no. have I okay, let me share the screen. God used the prophets in many ways to, um, hang on, this is Hosea 6. God would do things with the prophets that are, are very interesting. He would use them in a way to, to give a message to Israel. And here he's saying, come, let's turn back to God, the one who attacked and so can heal us, who wound it up, can also bind us up. Okay, let's pursue devotion to God, and we shall become devout. As sure as daybreak is God's appearance, which will come to us like rain, the latter rain that refreshes the earth. Um, Hosea was told that he needed to marry a prostitute. And the reason is he was showing Israel that they had given themselves up to prostitutions to other gods. And he says, that's why I have cut down the prophets because the prophets were, were speaking falsely. Have them slain with the words of my mouth 
and the day that dawn brought on your punishment. He says, I the false desire... prophets, not the prophets that we know, the false prophets. Yes, the false prophets. But some okay. of the prophets who were called by God ended up not prophesying wrongly because they preferred to follow, to have the, um, to please man and not God. Remember, the same thing happened with Aaron. He was called Aaron, but he, at that moment when when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, he chose to, to allow the people to take over. He was afraid right. of them. Right. And so sometimes this happens with even right. regular prophets. But it can happen to any one of us. Nobody's better than anyone else. And here it says, I desire goodness. It says chesed, mercy, not sacrifice. Devotion, but here in Hebrew, it's the dat, knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. God is saying, I don't need your burnt offerings. I want your devotion. So the, the whole idea of rebuilding the temple is solely for, the, for, for people and, their, and again, religious power has nothing to do with God, what God is asking us to do. And here, the next one is in Isaiah. Let me go just find it. Excuse me, I don't want to make you dizzy. Okay, Tanakh. We're going to Isaiah 1. That's our a, a great prophet, Yeshua 1. This is the prophecies of Isaiah, son of Amos, who prophesied concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for God has spoken. I reared children and brought them up but they have rebelled against me. An ox knows its owner, a donkey, its master's crib. Israel does not know. My people take no thought. He's calling us a sinful nation. Goy, hata, hate, like from hata'at, a nation who is guilty. People laden with iniquity, Look what he's calling us, a brood of evildoers, depraved children, because they have forsaken God. They spurned the Holy One of Israel. They turned their backs on him. And then it says here in verse 11, What need have I of all your sacrifices, said God? I'm filled to hear with the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the, the suet of fatlings and the blood of bulls. I have no delight in lambs and male goats that you come to appear before me. Who asked that of you? You trample my courts no more. Bringing your drink offerings are futile. Your incense is offensive to me. Your new moons and Shabbats Proclaiming of solemnities, assemblies with iniquity, I cannot abide. Your Rosh Chodeshim, your new moons, and your fixed seasons. Remember, he gave us Mo Moedim, but we change them. They fill me with loathing. They are a burden to me. I cannot endure them. When you lift up your hands, I will turn my eyes from you. Though you pray at length, I will not listen because your hands are stained with crime. Now, the next one is in one more Psalm 51. Let's turn to Psalm 51. Those are the Psalm 51, verse 18 to 19. Now, this is from King David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. So he was, he knew he had done wrong. He said, have mercy on me, O God, in keeping with your abundant compassion, blot out my transgressions. You see, David knew he had done wrong and he was asking God for forgiveness. Wash me thoroughly of my iniquity. He was acknowledging, admitting it and asking to be purified of his sins. For I recognize my transgressions. That is the key. And I'm ever conscious of my sin, of what my chata'at. Against you, God alone, 
have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight? And you are just in your sentence and right in your judgment, your mishpat. Indeed, I was born in iniquity. I was born right from birth where we have, we choose wrong. And with sin, my mother conceived me. Indeed, you desire truth about that which is written. Teach me wisdom about secret things. Purge me with hyssop till I am pure. Wash me till I am whiter than snow. Let me hear of joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed exalt. He was, he was so guilty right to the, his bones. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Fashion a pure heart for me, O God. Create in me a steadfast spirit. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit away from me. Let me again rejoice in your help and let a vigorous spirit sustain me. Okay, did I turn to 1, Isaiah 1, or is this Isaiah 11? Hang on a sec. Oh, no, this is Psalm 18 and 19. Okay, I haven't reached there yet. Here. And to the wicked God says, Who are you to recite my laws? What is the word for laws? And mouth the terms of my covenant. And that's what happens to so many people who talk about the word of God in their own way and mouth the terms of the covenant that he gave and they change them. Seeing that you spurn my discipline and brush my words aside. When you see a thief, you fall in with him and throw in your lot with adulterers. And you devote your mouth to evil and yoke your tongue to deceit. Wait a minute. This is not 18 and 19. This had to do, am I in the right verse? Psalm 51? Hold on. Sorry. Which no, I'm 50. 50. Okay. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but let's go to Psalm 51. <laughs> Okay. Oh, no. Yeah. I went back instead of forward. Okay. Psalm 51 was about Nathan. Okay. And let me go down to 1819. Here. Oh, Lord, yes. open my lips. <laughs> David, uh, Brian, turn off your sound, please. Let my mouth declare your praise. You do not want me to bring sacrifices. He knew what he did wrong. You do not, you do not desire burnt offerings. True sacrifice to God is a contrite spirit, a humble spirit. God, you will not despise a contrite and crushed heart. That's what God wants from us. That's amazing. Yeah. Moses, and Moses was one of the most humble of men. Yeshua was humble. Pharaoh was proud. God doesn't want us, when I hear today, our, my people, the Jews say, I am proud to be a Jew. What are we proud of? I was born a Jew. I didn't choose it. I have nothing to be proud of. What I can be proud of is something that I have achieved. But God doesn't want us to be proud. He wants us to be humble. Because being a Jew means that God gave us a choice. He called us the chosen people. What are we chosen for? My father used to say, let him choose somebody else for a change. All we do is suffer. He didn't choose us to suffer or not to suffer. He chose us to be obedient to his calling. He gave us, he brought us to Mount Sinai. He set us free from slavery, brought us to the base of Mount Sinai, spoke to us, even if we didn't want to hear him, we said, Moses, we don't want to hear him. You talk to us. You talk to him and you tell us what he said. We didn't want to hear him. We still don't want to hear him. He gave us his 10 words, 10 commandments. And he said, bring these to all the nations. And if you do, all, all, only good, you won't be sick. Like even here we read, don't eat the fat. Wise, wise, uh, wise words. 
He taught us how to keep safe during times of plagues. We had to wash. We couldn't eat certain <clears throat> foods. We knew how to be clean. We knew how to have to build, um, um, what do you call them, uh, latrines. We, we learned laws of cleanliness, and we needed to teach them to the rest of the world. Maybe if we had, there would have been no plagues. But also, it's, it's like it's a double-edged sword. Because sometimes when you want to tell people the good that God wants for us to do, they don't want to listen. So really, the only way we listen is by, after we've suffered, many of us have been broken. Like King David said, God wants a contrite and a broken spirit. And I know that I went through a time of real breaking in my life. And even now, when I when I start to feel too good about myself, oh, look what I do. <laughs> you know, God come, comes from behind me, behind the knees, and he knocks me, he knocks some <laughs> sense into me. And he said, oh, yeah, you think you're so great? Let me show you who you are. <laughs> and then I go to him like a loving father. I jump into his arms, and he's just so wonderful. I watch how he takes care of us. Right, Brian? Right. He makes a way. I had a call from that tourist. What, what? At the beginning, I had a call from that tourist, that girl. Okay. I didn't answer it. I didn't answer it. Good. Stay away from tourists. You don't need it. You want people in your life who build you up, who help you, and then you do the same for others. It's not all. We're, as a, a people who are chosen, we don't have the the right to be self-centered, to be selfish. When there's a person in need, we need to help them. And it's by giving that we receive. And and that takes time to learn. Because we don't, our, na our nature is to hold on to things. Our nature is not to share. And at the beginning, we need to kind of force ourselves a little bit. Many of us who have learned the, the idea of tithing Remember how hard it was at the beginning for us to tithe? Yeah. To give 10% to God? I remember at the beginning, I didn't, when I was rebuilding my life, I didn't have enough money for rent. I, sometimes I didn't know where the food was coming from. I had no clothes to where to work. And I would, I would try to bargain with God. And, uh, but I always remember, no, put God first in everything. And you will get back a hundredfold. And we don't give because we're going to receive. We give because it's the right thing to do. Right, Brian? God will love right. And, and back to the basics again about loving ourselves, which is a process, which doesn't mean the way we feel. It's, it's, it, it means um, having esteem, knowing that we're, we're worthy. Worthy, that's it. The word worthy. And yes. when I couldn't uh, so I helped somebody. Pardon? Like, uh, like little Joe. I helped little Joe. Yes. And today you are living in a place that God has provided for you and in amazing ways. I watched what God did to bring you to this new place. And there's a lot of people there who can use your help, even if it's a good word. That's why it's good to get out of your room and to just go down the house, say hello to people. People are lonely. They don't have families who I come visit every day. My name, bro. Get blessing. <laughs> Go introduce yourself. Exactly. I think soon they'll move you to another floor where people are a little more with it, and there yeah. you'll be able to do more. Yeah. A kind yeah. word, a helpful anything. You'd be surprised how when you're willing to help somebody, opportunities come up. You just step in and do it. Don't even question it. And the more you give the more you're going to see how you receive in your life. Blessings. It's amazing. That's just the way it works. Any uh, Anything I'm else? I'm painting a new picture. Pardon? I'm on a new picture. I'm painting a dog. Good. Finished uh, horses and I finished uh, Robin. Okay. Good. Yeah. I'm glad. Boy, now we have an artist in our midst. <laughs> That's marvelous. You have many gifts that you haven't even begun to explore yet, Brian. 
because your your beginnings were very difficult and people never saw you for who you are. But now God has given you a new role. He saved your life, basically. And now he's saying, okay, now you can serve me and you can bring light wherever you go. I was just listening to um, a, a young lady. Her name is Safir, uh, an Israeli lady. She was captured. At the oh, end. I started to look at that. It's unbelievable. I think, I don't know if I send it to you, Jerry. I'll send it to you, Brian. But I'm telling you, she she was led to read. She doesn't know why. But the whole month before she was kidnapped on October the 7th, she was led to read Psalm 27 over and over again. And it had to do with war. And she couldn't understand what it had to do with her. And she was kidnapped and taken into the tunnels. And that that those verses gave her, she felt God inside her. And even at even the person who kidnapped her and brought her into, into the tunnels looked at her and couldn't understand how she could be so happy. She was a light because there was another girl, a 16-year-old, who was so frightened. And she went and she encouraged her and she, they were, uh, whatever she had to do, and she exuded light. And this guy said, uh, you br he wanted to come and be around her because he said, you bring light into this place. Who, who you said that? Hamas? Hamas? Yeah. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. You've got I have to, to watch the rest. You have to watch it. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. We don't know what trials we're going to be put through in the coming days. But if we stick close to, if we have that relationship, da'at, knowledge of God, and we know that he knows our name and that he's with us, that's when we'll be able to shine. We need to be light in this dark world that each of us have that responsibility. That's what we're chosen for, to bring the light of his commandments to the rest of the world by living them, by sharing them. It's not by talking to people and telling them what to do. It's by living it, by being a light. And that's that's what these, uh, you know, these these messages are for us today. So any other thoughts on this before we close? No, you're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry, do you, are you ready to do uh, the Aaronic benediction, the, the Kohanim yes, blessing? Just, uh, let me put on my other glasses. Okay. Always good to listen to you, Peggy. Thank you, Jer. And... Uh, You know what page should? I can share it if you want. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm only joking. Okay. <laughs> so these blessings are geared to be given with love. And that's be is with Ahavo love. Be Ahavo. Baruch Hatad and I, Lehenu Melech HaOlam, I share to the Shon of Big Dushasoy. Shel Aaron, but she born the Barechers Amo Israel, Beahavo, Amen, Ahavaz love. Yevorecho Adonai, Beishmerecho Yae Adonai. Pana Velejo Bihuneko Yeso Adonai Pana Velejo Beyose Lejo Sha. Samu et Shemi al Bene Yisrael, Bani Arborachain. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face toward you 
and give you his shalom. So shall they put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Amen. And it should be God's will. Yes. And let's continue to pray for the rest of the hostages released. Those I who understand are alive. Uh, you're going on a little trip, uh, Peggy. Yes, I'm leaving on Sunday yeah, and I'll God be back. I wish you a safe going and a safe coming. And Thank we shall you so all much. look forward to seeing you once more. Thank you so much, Jerry. I won't be here next week, so we won't have a group next week, but I'll be back the following and we'll and I look forward to to doing this. I love it so much. You know, the there's nothing in all the years <clears throat> of looking for the truth. I found it in no other books, and I've read so and many of them. Some of us shall miss you during that time. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So I so wish you... you... You're going to have the numbers for this Saturday. You're going to send Yes, the don't worry. I will take care of you, Brian. Good. All right. So have a good evening. God bless you all, and we'll see you again, God willing, in two weeks. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank, Thank you. you.